Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture. We are a non-profit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This presentation and many others are available through our online library at instituteofcatholicculture.org and on our ICC app. Whether you are looking for weekly Bible studies, in-depth courses, or talks related to the faith, you will find it at the ICC. Please check out our upcoming schedule of live online events and engage with us on social media. All are welcome to join our growing international ICC family. For handouts, links, and further study materials, please visit this program's page on our website or app. Let's begin here in prayer. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Grant victory to our country over its enemies and preserve your community by the power of your cross. O Christ, our God, who chose by your free volition to be elevated upon the Holy Cross. Grant your mercies to your new people who are called by your name. In your power, gladden the hearts of our civil authorities. Strengthen them in every good deed so that your true alliance may be for them a weapon of peace and a standard of victory. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father Spitzer, we turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Father Hezekiah. And um, uh, I think many of you uh, were in attendance uh, on the seminar last week. And uh, you might recall for a second there, and I'm going to go through this in just a second with you, uh, the four levels of happiness with which we began, because that's the foundation for the whole thing. Uh, remember the, the byline, if we can just move people from level one and level two, you can, by sheer logic, by simple consistency, move them up to uh, level three and level four. If you do that, you can get them to a pro-life position. So our hope then is to uh, move people from level one and level two, and then when they are kind of choose willingly level three and level four, uh, they will see that uh, the pro-life position is the only position you can really have. And I'm gonna explain that um, in some detail tonight. Uh, previously, we talked about how level one, um, uh, level two, level three, level four views of happiness uh, and purpose in life, how they influence success and quality of life and love uh, in last week's uh, presentation. Now, we're going to be talking about uh, these other terms that are really important. So I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on the uh, four levels of happiness, uh, hoping that most of you have already seen it. Um, remember the one thing about the four levels of happiness, though, you people will willingly move to level three and level four. Once you talk about the comparison game, once you talk about the emptiness, the alienation, the loneliness that people feel if they never get to level three and level four, once you talk about winners and losers and drawers and, you know, the, the whole idea of self-pity on the one hand, or uh, jealousy and fear of failure and fear of loss of esteem and, and, and so forth on the other hand. So all of these emotions, these negative emotions that are generated by the comparison game, by the superficiality of level one and level two can only be resolved by people moving to level three and level four. And that's what makes them willing. That's what makes our kids willing to want to move up to that level. So let's take a look at uh, what we are going to talk about today. We're going to talk about suffering because um, uh, obviously that not only affects uh, the whole area of uh, pro-life, but it affects euthanasia in particular, the whole area of physician-assisted suicide in particular. The view you have, if you're level one, level two, uh, it's very likely you're going to be pro-assisted uh, suicide. If you've got a level three, level four view, it's very likely you will be pro-life. You will have, uh, you'll be against assisted suicide uh, for various reasons. So let's go also uh, to the, the next, uh, we'll explain all those categories there. So you're looking there at Epicurean and Stoic and so forth. 
Um, these are just uh, categories that help uh, people to explain, um, you know, a, a view of suffering that's commensurate with one of the levels of happiness. Okay, and then we'll uh, go from there uh, to the whole area of ethics. And again, uh, boy, the level you're on determines uh, the kind of ethical position you're, you're going to have. And you can see that some people have a, a view that we'll call it individual uh, utilitarian position, or uh, some have a social utilitarian position. Uh, some people have a, a view truly of, uh, of um, uh, ethics as uh, not just, um, you know, uh, uh, what we might call a contributive or teleological view of ethics, but finally, we get to a principle-based view of ethics, which is really important. But people who tend to be uh, level three and level four, uh, both have a teleological view as well as principle-based view, tend to be pro-life. Those who tend to be utilitarians do not. So once again, we see uh, what's going on here. And all we want to do, we don't want to push anybody into anything. We want to convince them by sheer consistency logic. Right, just being consistent to what you say you are. If you say you're level three and level four, then live it in all these respects. Then we go to freedom and we'll see, well, here you see freedom from and freedom for, but as we'll see, uh, this breaks down into categories of self-gratification, level one, self-determination, level two, and then of course, um, uh, uh, living for um, uh, the good of others, level three, and then finally surrender to God as freedom itself in level four. So um, again, uh, these, these categories, they matter so much because the, you know, people bat around this term pro-choice, et cetera, or pro-freedom. Uh, well, the whole question is, what do you mean by freedom? And we'll be beginning with that question. This is the question we can always start a conversation we don't have to, you know, uh, go in there with pistols blazing, um, you know, against somebody who is, uh, let's say, um, uh, claims to be pro-choice or pro-abortion. I think what we can do is just say, oh, well, what do you mean by freedom? What do you mean by choice? What do you mean these people are suffering? What, what do you mean by that? What do, you, what do you mean by you're an ethical person? Uh, do you mean ethics this way or, or that way, et cetera, et cetera? And the same thing holds true. Then we get come to the all important term of personhood, and oh, the way we define personhood, whether that's extrinsic, a materialistic worth, extrinsic worth, intrinsic worth, or intrinsic and transcendent worth, that's going to mean everything. I mean, if you believe that somebody has intrinsic value, uh, you know, then if that person is a human being, they have intrinsic value. They deserve protection under the law. That's just pretty clear. Uh, the same thing holds true with a level four, of course, uh, even greater, because you believe that uh, this person has intrinsic and transcendent value. We'll talk about that in a moment. But boy, the way you define personhood, that's going to change everything. That's going to uh, really change the ground of the debate. But we, if people say, well, you know, I do believe people have intrinsic value. And you have to, as a level three person, Right, you can't take the chance that some restricted form of extrinsic value, as we'll see, uh, can can affect, a, 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 could a, allow us or even cause us uh, to commit harm to somebody else. Um, if you're level three, you're going to have to stick with the intrinsic value uh, of de definition of personhood, and then you're swept into the pro-life position. Personhood is the critical term. That's the key uh, place where where things happen. Uh, then we're going to talk about rights. And of course, uh, there's the big question of inalienable rights versus extrinsic rights. But we're going to talk about the universality of rights. We're going to talk about this nexus of terms, right? Because, uh, you know, personhood is definitely related to rights, as we shall see. As personhood goes, so goes the notion of rights. We have to get a proper definition of inalienable rights so that, you know, people can't come along and say, well, abortion is an inalienable right. Well, no, no, it's not. And, and by the very definition of an inalienable right, uh, you know, which gives it's necessary to be human, necessary in order to have the minimum justice uh, needed to be human. If that's the case, well, you really don't need and an, uh, you don't have to have an abortion uh, in order to be human, to act like a human being. Uh, again, with respect to slavery, uh, we saw with Dred Scott, and we'll see again, 
uh, in this talk. Well, you know, the, do you need to hold slaves in, in order to be human, in order to act like a human being? Well, if you don't have to own slaves, it's not an inalienable right. But life's an inalienable right. Liberty's an inalienable right. So we're going to go through this in a little bit of detail here. We got to get our, you know, our terms down. And as pro-lifers, you know, the, the, the debate is going to be won or lost on the terms we have. But the one paradigm you can put your, you know, hang your hat on is, is truly these four levels of happiness. They help us to articulate our position. They help us to get, you know, that, the right words there. So we see uh, the consistency and how to tap into uh, previous uh, views of uh, uh, personhood and so forth. It helps people uh, to see how this works. So finally, of course, then we can get into abortion, for which there could be a very good uh, case made just on the basis of biology alone. And then we're going to get into the innocent uh, victims that are produced by assisted suicide. So let's uh, go into some of these things that I just mentioned in a little bit more detail now. Uh, remember, four levels of happiness, just real quick review. Level one is basically pleasure and materialism. So, uh, you know, basically hedonism, materialism, pleasure-based, uh, materialistic base, right? If I increase my greatest number of pleasure impulses per second, I'm happy, right? If I have the new Mercedes 500 E-Class with leather upholstery, I'm happy. Yeah, everybody gets it, no problem. Level two, remember, that's ego comparative happiness. This is the kind of happiness that comes when um, not only somebody recognizes me uh, for being better than others, but basically I see myself as better than others. And, and um, uh, we'll talk about how that manifests itself. Uh, but it, essentially, happiness comes from success, from being better than others, from being recognized that I'm better than others, having more intelligence, more achievements. Uh, more um, popularity, more status, uh, more winning than other people. Level three, as you will recall, is flip it around. It's just the opposite. That's contributive. So it's the kind of happiness or purpose in life that comes from making an optimal positive difference to somebody or something beyond myself. Indeed, I want to make an optimal positive difference to as many people as I can make an optimal positive difference to beyond myself. So now we're flipping from, you know, the arrow pointing toward the self as it does in level one and level two. Now is we're moving from the self to others around me, uh, to making a positive difference uh, to the world. I want to make an optimal positive difference uh, to the world, to my family, to my friends, to my community, to my church, to the kingdom of God, to the society, to the culture, uh, to my uh, law firm, to my uh, you know, uh, school, whatever it may be. I want to make an optimal positive difference in every context of my life. I want to be uh, utterly contributive. That's what will make my life happy. That's what will give me purpose. And of course, level four, uh, we all know that great phrase of St. Augustine, for thou hast made us for thyself. And our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. It's not just God alone, but we desire perfect truth and perfect goodness and perfect love and perfect beauty and perfect home. And, and so, you know, these alone, uh, these things are God alone. There's only one perfect, uh, unconditional truth. There can only be one. By the way, there's a very good proof of that in one of my books um, uh, called uh, um, uh, uh, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions in Contemporary Physics and Philosophy. So you take a look at that proof in there, and it's pretty clear. Um, you can only have one of them. God alone can give me perfect truth. God alone can give me the perfect love that I desire. God alone can give me the perfect beauty that I desire. God alone can give me the perfect goodness that I desire. We're ultimatizers. We have a soul, as we shall see. And one of the key proofs, one of the key ways in which we recognize what the soul is, as Plato determined a long time ago in the Phaedo, uh, especially in the Phaedo, uh, his dialogue there, um, uh, is by looking at these transcendental desires within ourselves, and then finding that these transcendental desires are nested in, in one single being, a being, uh, you know, you, you can't have a multiplicity of, of, of perfections, a multiplicity of the unconditional, a multiplicity of the infinite. Um, all of these things uh, must be singular. And so God alone, St. Augustine was right, God alone can satisfy us. For thou hast made us for thyself, 
our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Notice that as you move up the scale, you're getting ever more pervasive to the point where you're affecting so many people on level four and ever more enduring. I mean, when you get up to level four, you're talking about eternity uh, and, and, and deep, qualitatively deep, that we're using our highest powers. We use the very highest powers in all the levels when we get up to level four to transcend it. Uh, identity to transcendent happiness and purpose. Okay, so uh, that's a little quick review there. So um, we're getting higher and higher, but remember, we have to give up a little bit of that immediate gratification, surface apparentness, and um, uh, the uh, uh, you know superficial, um, easy to understand and grasp and do stuff that you get in level one and level two. Let's go now to um, uh, our big area of suffering. Uh, obviously, there's a huge amount to be done in suffering, and I wrote a huge book on it called uh, The Light Shines On in the Darkness, Transforming Our Suffering Through Faith. Now, I'm not going to go through that today, but what I want you to see, and what's really important for the pro-life movement, is that these four big schools of thought on suffering. Uh, the first school of thought is uh, pretty clear there, the Epicurean school of thought. The Epicureans didn't believe suffering had any value in it whatsoever. So in other words, since there's no value in suffering, it, it, you know, how, do we, how do we make something out of the pain we feel, the deprivation and weakness we feel, uh, all these deficits that we feel in our life? If there's no value to, to this, what can you do? Well, it's easy. You compensate with pleasure. That's what the Epicurean does. And not only does he compensate with pressure, pleasure, but lots more pleasure than the pains that he's trying to remedy. So if you had a really bad day, have five scotches, uh, would recommend the Epicurean, unless the hangover is bothersome to you. Okay, the second area is the Stoics. Stoics don't really like Epicureans. They find them rather repulsive little uh, hedonistic creatures. Nevertheless, um, the Stoics do say this, suffering does have a meaning. And the meaning that it has is that it causes me, it incites me to move beyond my pain. It incites me uh, to move beyond uh, the, the uh, uh, mediocrity in which I am emerged. It forces me to be stronger. It forces me to be courageous. It forces me to be self-disciplined. In other words, suffering calls something virtuous, what we call the stoic virtues out of us, right? It calls forth courage and strength and, and uh, uh, self-determination and, and self-discipline. So these are all good stoic virtues, right? We can hear Marcus Aurelius citing these, Epicurus citing these kinds of virtues as the, the key. Uh, one. But well, beyond that, I mean, remember, all this stuff is self, 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 self-discipline and strength and so forth. It's all oriented toward the self. There's self-virtues rather than other-oriented virtue. Let's go now to um, what we would call a virtue-based uh, view of suffering. And here, the orientation, as level three does, moves outward. So the purpose of suffering is not just to call me to the stoic virtues, but all the other other-centered virtues, when I've got virtues regarding other people in mind. So if I'm talking about being compassionate, suffering with somebody, right? So, uh, um, you know, there might be suffering in my life, but it might call me to a whole new uh, form of compassion. Uh, and St. Paul talks about, well, this would be more uh, transcendent uh, for a second, but we all know that we can learn a lot from suffering. Boy, you know, I'm not going to uh, do that again. Um, you, you could say, well, that's more of a stoic virtue and and so forth, but then we can kind of push that uh, to an other-centered virtue as well. Uh, we can learn not only to identify and empathize with people in their suffering, walk in their shoes a little bit. So my suffering enables me to deepen my empathy for others. My suffering enables me to uh, deepen my identification with others who are suffering, which opens the whole world of compassion, suffering with to be caring and sympathetic and, and attempting to alleviate the suffering of others. These things are good things in themselves, this kind of love uh, that uh, we're talking about here. So we could just in general say 
suffering moves us toward love, the kind of caritas love, the self-giving love that Jesus talks about, and that kind of suffering, in as much as it moves us toward love, it's, it's truly enabling us to serve others, to make an optimal positive difference beyond ourselves. Suffering's not so bad. Suffering actually frees us from our selfishness, opens us to sympathy and empathy with others, and opens us to the compassion that leads to the service of others, optimal service of others, not a bad deal, a really good, as it were, value for your suffering. And finally, of course, there's the religious or transcendent view of suffering, very important um, uh, view, because uh, Boy, uh, religion makes all the difference in the world, and Christian religion in particular makes all the difference in the world. Once you bring eternal life into the picture, once you bring the transcendentals into the picture, once you bring into the picture the whole absolute context, the absolute ground, the absolute meaning of God being present to our, our lives and us opening ourselves to God ever more deeply, right? Once you've got that view, then you can say with Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, right? I was given a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan to beat me, to keep me from getting proud. But, you know, uh, uh, I, I discovered, uh, you know, I asked the Lord three times, take this suffering away from me. Three times means over and over and over again, lots and lots and lots and lots of times, not literally three. Asked him three times, take it away from me, but he saw fit not to. And now I discovered that in my weakness is my strength. As I grow weaker, Jesus Christ grows stronger within me. That's the virtue. That's the, you know, where I'm going. And then if Jesus is growing stronger in me, it's all leading to what? The purification of my love and the, away from my pride, as, as, as uh, um, St. Paul would say, right? I, I was given angels to beat me to keep me from getting proud. So it's away from my pride, the purification of my love, which is leading where? Eternal love, eternal life and joy with others, and an eternal life and love, a purification of love that is so profound in the very image and example of Christ that it truly opens me to be like Christ Jesus, my Lord, in the service of those who are suffering. This is a really good value for suffering, and Christianity certainly has the best explanation for it um, that we can possibly have. Well, does this have an effect in the pro-life movement? Absolutely. I mean, euthanasia, right? The physician-assisted suicide if, for an Epicurean, if I got a whole bunch of terminal pain and there's no, you know, the, the morphine's kind of run out, you know, I, I can just give myself enough to, to not knock myself out flat, but, but there's no compensating pleasures really for me anymore. Of course, an Epicurean is going to say, well, suicide, that looks like an, a preferred option. They don't have any transcendent meaning. They don't have any value like God. They don't have any sense of eternal life. They don't have any sense of the absolute. They have no sense of the, the hierarchy, the, the, the supremacy of love, caritas, as Jesus has defined it in the Beatitudes. They got nothing. Well, you know, suicide? Why? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, I can't even enjoy a glass of Chateau Margot anymore. You know, I may as well just go, you know, and so the, the same thing happens with people who are level two. Level two is not going to help you. If you're a stoic, what happens when you run out of options? What happens when you can't recover anymore? What happens when you cannot rise beyond mediocrity? What happens when you can no longer develop some courage and some strength? You're just getting weaker and weaker in the terminal illness or whatever it may be. You keep self-discipline is you know, out of the question. You're just turning you know, into a, a, you know, a, a weak human being, no possibility of making yourself strong. What does the Stoic say? Remember Walker Percy's book, right? The, the Second Coming, uh, Will Barrett. Uh, he keeps quoting his father. And, and you know, this is, a, by the way, a big, huge debate between Christianity and Stoicism. And in this book, what does Will Barrett say? Better to be dead than the living dead. I'm not going to crawl around like some little weakling uh, out there. I'm just going to shoot myself just like my father shot himself and tried to shoot me. That makes sense to a stoic. 
to a Christian, it's abhorrent, right? To somebody who believes in a loving God, to somebody who believes in, in the eternity, uh, in the eternal life that's given to us by Christ Jesus, our Lord, to somebody who really believes in the power of compassion, the power of caring compassion in times of other suffering or, or you know, the ability to sympathize with others and, and help others in their need, etc. To somebody who feels that way, of course, it's, you know, there's a wonderful book called All I Can Give. Forget the, the author's name right now, but if you look it up, uh, he, he's a, a, a quadriplegic. He's, he's literally reduced to flat on his back. Somebody's got to roll him and, and so forth and, and, and every single day. But what is he doing? He's giving witness to God. He's giving witness to hope. He's giving witness to eternal life. He's giving witness to Jesus Christ in that book because he has uh, not only um, a, a virtue-based uh, view of suffering, uh, you know, that love can come out of it, but also he has a transcendent-based view of suffering uh, and certainly a Christian-based uh, view of suffering, which says it's all going to lead not just to the purification of love, but it's going to enable me to serve others even in my profound weakness. And therein, my purpose in this life is sealed. And more than that, I'll have eternal life with the Lord of love and compassion in the next. Huh, wow, what a difference level one, two, three, and four makes as to how we interpret suffering, especially in the pro-life issues. Let's go to the second area that's really uh, important as well, moving beyond suffering here. We go to ethics. And again, people will say, well, I'm an ethical person. You know, you know what do you mean? Uh, accusing me of being dishonest? But we always have to ask that question. The, this is the, the, the conversation starter. What do you mean by ethics? What do you mean by that term? And of course, we level one people generally choose a Benthamite kind of an ethic, right? That, that here's a person who's basically materialistic and pleasure oriented, right? And what does individual utilitarianism mean in a Benthamite uh, uh, perspective? I am responsible for what? for increasing my pleasure impulses per second and decreasing my pain impulses per second. And I'm responsible to myself alone, although I probably should not violate the law or should not cause huge unnecessary harms to others. I think uh, uh, Jeremy Bentham might grudgingly uh, you know, acknowledge this, but essentially I'm responsible myself. And what do I do for myself? I increase my pleasure, I decrease my pain, that's it. Now, you could, you know, Chris is going to say, that's hardly an ethical position, Jeremy. And indeed, it is hardly an ethical position from any Christian perspective, any level three or level four perspective. But to a level one person, there's no other context except my pleasure and pain. Why not? Jeremy Bentham, of course, uh, you can see the net result at the end of his life. He said, oh, what would I really like for my afterlife? Why? I would like to be stuffed and preserved so that and put in a wheelchair so that I might be wheeled into the board of directors of my company henceforth. This is his view of afterlife. Eh, well, you know, there you go. This is the, the, uh, the result of level one taken to the extreme to become the ethical position. OK, let's go to the level two uh, viewpoint. Here we get a, kind of a social utilitarian uh, position. And it basically gets us to the silver rule, which is ethical minimalism, but just still much better than individual utilitarian pleasure um, utilitarianism. Right now, we get to kind of a social utilitarianism which says, look, I'm responsible to myself, all right, so long right, as I don't do any unnecessary harms to others. So if I do not do unnecessary harms to others, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm OK. You know, I, I, I can't go around. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, causing people unnecessary pain, but at the same time, um, uh, you know, I have a right to continue to pursue my pleasure, to con uh, to pursue my ego objective, to com uh, combine, you know, all the opportunities for success that I can get, etc. So what we'll call limited ethical restriction. Then we get to the third area. Once we go to level three, we're shifting the perspective. Now, uh, we're talking about what we'll call a teleological ethic. Uh, by the way, you can see this in Joseph Fletcher's situation ethics, for example. Right? I'm responsible for doing 
uh, the greatest amount of uh, neighbor welfare for the greatest number of people in um, the various situations, situationism, right? And in each situation, uh, there's no sense uh, here um, in, in the extreme form of level three ethics, uh, teleological ethics, where all we're doing here is maximizing the good, but there is a forgetfulness of uh, um, principles, a forgetfulness of the me. Now, of course, in Christian ethics, everybody has heard the end doesn't justify the means, which, of course, came from St. Augustine and became um, well, one of the key principles of ethics, even in the secular world. You can't use an evil means to get to a good end. You, you just can't do that and uh, because the evil of the means undermines the good of the end you're trying to achieve. So that idea, though, is easily forgotten in a purely teleological system. I'm here to maximize the good. That's what level three people do. But I also must respect or restrict myself to principles that will help me not do evil in the process, not do something dishonest in the process. That part, the level three person can easily forget. And because of that, we genuinely need to move up to level four or transcendent ethics. Some people say, I have discovered objective moral principles all by myself. I didn't need God and I didn't need religion to get to objective moral principles. When in point of fact, um, if you look at the, the real world out there, 90% of the people who do believe in an objective, principle-based, deontological ethic, they have some sense of religion a responsibility to God, a responsibility to their conscience. And they believe that their conscience is definitely influenced by the voice of God, the voice of that loving father, but that voice of that law-giving father at the same time. You, you, if you just kind of scratch a, a deontological principle-based ethical person, natural law ethical person, even though you don't technically have to have a sense of God in order to come to a sense of those objective principles, you'll find that about 90% of the time, what you have there is a religious person, a person who feels um, responsible to God because of his faith life, and a person who believes that his conscience is not just some kind of training that you get in a Freudian sense, the subconscious mind trained by my parents and teachers, you know, turned into a superego that oversees me uh, in, in the sense of guilt. No, uh, you know, most people who believe in an objective basis don't think it's, and it has anything to, you know, has little enough to do with the, um, with the, the feelings of, um, uh, you know, that are manifest by a conscience that is simply uh, determined by training uh, by parents and teachers. They think it's God, that God is speaking through that conscience, a profound guilt and alienation that they feel it's not just about getting some parental training. Parental training will create fear. It won't create profound self-alienation and guilt, a sense of, of, of emptiness that comes uh, with uh, uh, going forward uh, without um, listening to my conscience. So I think it's fair to say that, you know, if you want to get up to principle-based ethics, if you want to get up to listening to your conscience, if you want to get up to forming your conscience on the basis of objective principle, you're going to need religion in some form or another. Christianity is fantastic here. Uh, if people are interested in this whole topic, you might read a book by C.S. Lewis called The Abolition of Man. And if you want to see those eight principles that are common to the conscience of just about every culture and religion throughout the world, uh, take a look at his appendix in that book, The Abolition of Man. But in any case, yeah, uh, the higher we go up the happiness scale, uh, the more that we embrace God, uh, the transcendent, the eternal, the absolute, the more that we know that the voice within conscience is the voice of that absolute, is the voice of that God that is speaking to us, advising us, alienating us from ourselves, or filling us with a sense of nobility and goodness when we uh, are following those objective norms, etc. Okay, uh, does this make a, a difference to the pro-life movement? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, hey, if you're a pleasure utilitarian, are you ever 
going to feel any responsibility to anybody else? Uh, I mean, an, even an infant that's in your womb? No, a pleasure utilitarian just said, I do what's my pleasure. Oh, this baby's not causing me pleasure. Okay, um, well, got to end that baby. Uh, if it's legal anyway, got to end that baby. And the same thing is, uh, you know, a social utilitarian, uh, even a teleological person, you got to be kind of careful because arguments can be construed in teleology. I'm just optimizing the good uh, by um, uh, aborting my baby because there's going to be a whole bunch of social pressure out there that has to be avoided. And I'm just trying to maximize the good. I want everybody in my family to feel comfortable. Besides, there's an overpopulation problem. And you can see without objective principles, you know, what I call the Spitzerian principle of infinite rationalization. It just goes forward. And, um, uh, you know, I don't need to explain anymore. If you don't have anything regulating, you, if you have, if you're not accountable to a moral agency like God beyond yourself, if you have no sense of objective principles that are forming your conscience and that conscience is directing itself with those things and through those things, if you don't have any sense of that, I assure you of this much, I, I think it's going to be really hard for you to have that just looking right at abortion and going, oh my gosh, this is murder of an innocent. I mean, I can't possibly bring myself to do this. I can't bring myself to do this in my conscience. I can't bring myself to do this before God. I can't bring myself to do it because it is such a violation of everything that is meant to be the goodness of life itself that is ordained by the divine and, of course, is spoken to us, you know, vibrantly and, and with great feelings of alienation, guilt on the one hand, or nobility and sensibility toward God on the other hand, when we're doing the good, right? Uh, I, you know, I, it's going to be tough, tough without getting up to level four, uh, certainly level three and level four, if you put it together, uh, there's no doubt. you, you got to be pro-life. It's just, you, you know, who can do this? Okay, let's go to the next um, uh, area. Now we get into the area of freedom, and I'm just going to have to do this uh, rather quickly here because I've been loquacious uh, up to this point. But uh, uh, basically level one and level two are what we'll call freedom from. The view of freedom, indeed, I feel elated. I feel the sense of freedom and the elation from the sense of freedom when I'm escaping constraints, when I'm getting out of something, when I can just do whatever I want. I can, right now, I'm responsible to only one thing. I'm going to fulfill the, uh, my strongest emotional desires and my stronger se strongest sensual desires and my strongest egotistical desires. I'm going for it. I'm free. I'm me. I'm going to do this. Okay. Uh, I'm getting away from constraints and I'm free to do whatever I want. I mean, um, there's a very little ethical restriction. Remember, you're on level one, level two. You're basically a pleasure utilitarian or social utilitarian. What are you, you going to do? So the point is, I feel free when I'm escaping constraint. I feel free when I can do whatever I wish. Uh, to fulfill my sensual and egotistical uh, desires, et cetera, et cetera. You can see already uh, the problem that's going to happen. I'll never be able to commit myself to anything. I'll never be able to commit myself to a, a principle. I'll never be able to commit myself in self-sacrificial and charitable love to anybody. I mean, commitment, commitment. I want freedom from, I'm not a freedom for guy. I just want you to leave me alone and not lay any trips on me. You get the point. Enough said. Let's call this view of freedom self-gratification. Freedom is self-gratification. And let's go to the next notion of freedom. is level two. Again, it's a form of freedom from. It's escape from uh, you know, constraints and so forth and so on. Except for here, in this particular case, I'm not absolutizing the escape from constraints and the being free to do what my strongest emotional and sensual and, and egotistical desire is at the particular moment, right? Now I'm thinking to myself, okay, and a level two guy is, is thinking, I want to make the most out of my life. I want to achieve something. I want to have comparative advantage. I want people to recognize me to have some honor and success in my life. I don't want to be just some uh, pleasure-seeking Epicurean dolt. 
right? I, I really want something more than that. So uh, again, a, a person who uh, you know sees that, he knows he's got to be self-disciplined or she knows she's got to be self-disciplined. She's going to have to pull a little curb on things. She's going to have to constrain herself. She's going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to give up that candy bar and I'm going to have to give up that leisure time because if I don't give that stuff up, I'm never going to go anywhere. I'm never going to get that education. I'm never going to get that super job that I want. I'm never going to be able to do the maximum I could have done with my life because I just laid around all day and did nothing. So the, the, the fact is, there is right here uh, what I'm going to call, um, uh, it's a lot of freedom from, right? I, I don't want you bugging me, and I don't want you constraining me, and I don't want to commit myself to you. I want to be me, but I am going to discipline myself. I am going to constrain my options so that I can at least achieve something and get a modicum of recognition and success and some honor, et cetera. Okay, that's your, your basic freedom from options. I, I don't have to tell you when somebody goes around going, I'm pro-choice, and they mean level one or level two freedom, right? Either self-determination is my objective, that's level two, or self-gratification is my objective, that's level one. I don't have to tell you. I mean, pro-choice, just give me what I want and just get away from me. I'm not responsible to anybody. You know, I'm just responsible to me. Okay, let's go down to um, uh, level three. And now when we're in level three, we see that there's, a, again, the, the, the transition we've seen all the way along the line. Now it's no longer freedom from. Freedom for is the operative thing. What do I want to live for long term? What is worthy of me? What's worthy of me? I want to leave an optimal legacy in this world. I don't want to lollygag around here and do nothing. I want to basically make some kind of a difference to the world around me. I want to make an optimal positive difference to my family. I want to make an optimal positive difference to my friends. I want to make an optimal positive difference to my workplace. I want to make an optimal positive difference to my business. I want to make an optimal. But what happens the minute you start saying, I want to make an optimal positive difference to two things, the two C words the two horrible C words for anybody who's level one and level two. Number one, you're going to have to constrain yourself. You're going to have to give up a, a little bit of the, your pleasure. And you're going to have to give that over. You're going to have to give up a lot of your ego if you're going to devote yourself to making an optimal positive difference to your church, to the kingdom of God, uh, to your workplace, to the society, to the culture, uh, to your family, to your friends. I mean, if you're devoted to others, you got to take the limelight off yourself. You got to take, uh, you know, the the focus off yourself. The locus of control off yourself. And if that's the case, uh, no question about it, you're going to have to constrain yourself. And not only that, you're going to have to commit yourself to the other that you want to do the good for. You got to make some kinds of commitments, and those kinds of commitments you're probably going to have some self-sacrificial dimension to it. So it's going to be a self-sacrificial commitment. Now you talk about, well, I'm pro-choice now. And you've got a notion, well, freedom really is about me getting to what the most worthy thing is for me, the most noble kind of life I can live, the maximum legacy I can leave, uh, leave um, kind of a life. Well, if that's really the case for you, then I would say uh, the first thing that we have to consider is, um, well, I got to commit myself, but that means I'm going for something and I'm going to constrain myself. And I'm going to focus on the other instead of focusing on me. That's a very different kind of freedom, a very different kind of choice. It's choice for the good, choice for the good of the other, choice for the optimal good beyond myself. So uh, it's a, a, a no question. It's, it's a choice. Um, uh, but it's it's not just to be free from. It's a choice to be free for others to do the optimal good. Well, can abortion be consistent with freedom for the optimal good of the other? Absolutely not. I mean, are you kidding me? Killing babies really isn't consistent with um, doing the optimal good for the world around me. Enough said. Uh, going to level four, 
Of course, now the view of freedom is surrender to God, right? In this particular view of of, of um, freedom, I'm saying, hey, there really exists an absolute being with absolute meaning and absolute success. Of course, I'm Catholic. I believe Jesus Christ has, and his teachings interpreted through the church is that meaning. I just surrender to it. I don't think I'm better than it. I know that, uh, you know, I, much as I'd like to be self-determined, I'm going to have to surrender to God to come to the ultimate optimal legacy I can leave with my life. Following God is not just the path to eternal happiness. It's the path to making the most out of my life, to live the most noble life I can live. It may involve the cross. It may involve giving up a whole lot of stuff and being like St. Francis and living in poverty. It may involve whatever. But my thought here is if I really want to be free, free to live an optimally worthy life, free to live an optimal life of legacy, free uh, to live uh, something in conformity with the Lord I love, the absolute was the absolute meaning of my life. If I'm going to be free for that, then I'm going to have to commit myself, but not just constrain myself and commit myself. I'm going to have to surrender to God himself, surrender to his way, surrender to his law. Oh, believe me, obedience to God is a tough thing. But what a beautiful kind of freedom it is, as St. Augustine tells us, right? You know, every, everything inside of us is, well, wait a minute, surrendering to God and obeying to God, this is contrary to freedom. No, it's only contrary to freedom from. It's not contrary to freedom for. It's not contrary to the commitment and the surrender that gives us, it puts us in a position to do an, uh, the optimal good for the world around us the optimal good with our lives by following uh, the prescriptions of God, by following the teaching of Jesus. Now, if that's the case, if, if that's what freedom really means, the freedom that will open upon a huge legacy, the freedom that will open upon eternal life, the freedom that will open upon me helping as many people as can possibly help with the kinds of gifts that I have. Well, gosh, God would know it. After all, what's God's will? What's God's will? Optimal salvation, optimal love, optimal goodness, not just for me, but for as many people around me as possible through me, through the people I touch, right? So I, I, I want to get, the, you know, I'm, I'm a conduit of God's goodness for the world. Well, if you want to have an optimal life, if you want to be like a Mother Teresa, if you want to be like a, a you know, a, a, um, you know a, a, a Peter Canisius, if you, if you want to be like um, you know, one of the great saints uh, who just serves all of these people. What? All you got to do is surrender to God. Boy, what a life you will have. Mother Teresa didn't do badly uh, by her life. And, and of course, uh, uh, St. Peter Claver. I mean, wow, uh, that, that's a big one. He's serving the slaves, baptizing 300,000 people. What did he say he was doing the whole time? I was trying to follow the Lord. I surrendered to the Lord. I gave him my freedom. I decided I'd serve the slaves. But of course, it turned out to be a most worthy life indeed. Okay, uh, I, I don't have to tell you what a difference that when we use that bat that word choice around in the so-called pro-life movement, pro-abortion movement, we're talking about well, choice. Everything turns on that view of what we mean by choice. Okay, let's go to the our next uh, term. And here's where the rubber hits the road. Because at this juncture, it's all about personhood. And if you went level three or level four, right down the line, if you did that with respect to um, love, uh, which we talked about last week, suffering, uh, ethics, and freedom, guess what? <laughs> You're going to have uh, this level three and level four view of personhood. It's going to make uh, pro-life inescapable. There's no way you can get out of it and be consistent, be compatible with your views of freedom and love and ethics, et cetera. So let's just take a, a quick look at um, various ways of uh, defining personhood. Of course, level one has a materialistic view of um, uh, personhood. So what's a person? A person has got lots of stuff. So, right, you, you, you know, uh, are, you a, uh, are you a worthy person or are you not? Well, how much stuff do you have? How rich are you? 
and and uh, and so forth and so on. Some very materialistic view of of, of personhood, um, and nevertheless, people want to use that all the time. An extrinsic criterion, right? Um, uh, for for personhood, and the extrinsic criterion is the stuff uh, that you have. Uh, you got the Mercedes 500 E class. <laughs> you have worth. You have extrinsic value. You the guy, right? You got the Mercedes. You're worth something. Uh, there's the guy with the Volkswagen. He's not worth anything. He's got little extrinsic value. Actually, I like Volkswagen. Uh, choose another example. Whatever. Uh, whatever the some uh, unworthy car by comparison to the Mercedes. Okay, enough said. Let's go to level two because this one is a biggie within our culture. Personhood means, and remember, we're still dealing with extrinsic, extrinsic valuation, a valuation that comes not to the person in, an, in himself or herself, but comes from the outside. How many accomplishments do you have? I'll tell you whether you're deserving of protection in the law. I'll tell you whether you have value or not. So where'd you go to college? And um, uh, what degrees did you get? And how much income are you earning? And by the way, um, you know, what are you doing that's of any relevance to, uh, you know, to society today? Are you just a, a, a resource consumer, right? So that remember, whenever you're talking about extrinsic worth, level two is always doing what? Comparing. Therefore, level two is never looking at intrinsic worth. Never looking at the value of a person in a person's self. Never looking at the desire uh, for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being. I mean, that's the intrinsic worth, right? Never looking at the capacity for empathy and the capacity for conscience and the capacity to do good beyond the self. Eh, level two doesn't want to do anything like that. Just wants to know, did you make something out of yourself? Do you have enough accomplishments? If you do, huh, then you got worth. Maybe we'll consider you a person. But if not, maybe we consider you a sub-person, a sub-human, right? And this, of course, happened uh, throughout history, especially with respect to the slavery issue. Same thing holds true with, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, are there other things besides accomplishments? Sure, your intelligence quotient. You don't have a, an IQ over 120? Well, I'm sorry. You know, what are you going to do for society, big dope? You know, uh, let's come our way here. And uh, um, just admit it, you know, maybe uh, uh, you should take a shorter end of life, right? Uh, maybe you're getting a little involuntary euthanasia. Oh, you're suffering, are you, right now? Got a little bit of a decrease, a little bit of... Uh, of a dementia in your life, a little Alzheimer's. Well, there you go. I mean, uh, you just lost your worth. And if you lost your worth, remember, it's all about extrinsic worth in level two. If you lost your extrinsic worth, you lost your worth, period. You lost your worth, you lost your personhood. You lose your personhood, as we'll see in a moment. You lose your rights, even your inalienable rights. You're just a subhuman. You have nothing to attach personhood to. And so the, uh, let's go to the third uh, area here. Again, critical move. Now we get level three people are contributive, and we'll see in a moment. That means they're going to have to ha believe in the intrinsic worth, the intrinsic value of a human being, the value of a human being in himself, in herself. That's going to be the true value, irrespective of any kind of extrinsic valuation, your intelligence quotient, your athletic ability, uh, you know, um, your, uh, as the Nazis would say, your Aryan uh, lineage, et cetera, et cetera. Ex irrespective of any of it, the one thing that matters is because you're human, because you're a human being, you have worth in yourself. And that worth, right, we can sense that sense of worth. Uh, as somebody who uh, can be profoundly, right, if you go to a large community, see some people who uh, have some really profound, um, you know, uh, mental and emotional challenges, and you look at those great kids in that large community, and what's the one thing you come away from? Well, of course, they love God very much, but they also love you. 
they are just the, the nicest people in the world. They want to relate to you. They're almost innocent. They, they, they're like without agenda. Well, I, I am, I am uh, digressing here for a moment, but the point I'm trying to make is everybody, of course, has the capacity for empathy. Everybody, of course, has this capacity to want to make a difference, to be in a profoundly human relationship with somebody else. Because every single human being, I don't care what the intelligence quotient is, you know, every one of them has an ego. That is to say, self-consciousness. And every one of them has empathy that counteracts the ego. And those two great powers combine. I don't care what the intelligence quotient is. I don't care what the opportunity level is. I don't care what uh, ex, you know, accomplishments they had or didn't have. It doesn't make any difference. The very fact that they can relate profoundly, humanly, empathetically, and even have a sense of God and the good all the while. And they do. Oh, they do. When you look at that, you go, aha. So that person is good. Now, why must a level three person have a view of, of worth of the human being as intrinsic value or intrinsic worth that belongs to that human being in himself that's distinctly human and, and uh, you know, is what makes the difference um, between um, uh, uh, being a human being deserving of protection of the law or not? What's, what's the, the whole thing? What's the, what's the difference? Uh, well, the reason that level three people have to do that is because imagine for a second that you said, no, um, and instead of every human being has intrinsic worth, every human being has intrinsic value in themselves, right? Instead of saying that, you said, no, there's some extrinsic valuation, but you're level three. What's the fear if you're a level three person? That if my view of extrinsic valuation is just that much too restrictive, I could do enormous harm to somebody. I'd say, hey, it's okay to kill that person. Or, hey, it's okay to marginalize that person. Or, hey, you know, they don't have the extrinsic valuation. You know, it's like Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, you know, Mr. Scrooge, would you care to give something here at Christmas time? You know, no, I would not. Well, well, why not? Uh, you, you, you have plenty of, of money, of funds. Uh, gentlemen, I have already done as much as I can do. I give to the prisons, don't I? I give to the workhouses, don't I? Right? I give to the poverty, uh, these uh, centers of uh, impoverishment, do I not? Most people would rather be dead and go to those places, well, let them die then, and that'll take care of the surplus population. Now, what's the point that I'm bringing this out at this juncture? Scrooge has written them off. They don't have the economic valuation possibilities, the opportunity possibility, or seemingly uh, the intelligence quotient, at least in his opinion, possibilities, et cetera, et cetera. And because of that, it just they're they're worthless. They're objectified. They're treated as things. They're thingified, and they're thrown away. Just let them die. Then that'll take care of the problem of surplus population. Well, that comes back to haunt old Scrooge, but um, that's not for us to dis uh, to decide tonight. But what is the problem with the level three person trying to have extrinsic value um, evaluation of personhood rather than intrinsic valuation of personhood? If I restrict that value. If I forget anything that belongs to that human being, if somehow my view of extrinsic value falls outside of the category, then I'm going to wind up saying what Scrooge said. Well, they're worth nothing or they're worth little. Send them to the flop houses, send them to the workhouses, and send them to the jails. That's all they're worth. That's all they're worth. I could do inestimable harm. But remember what you are as a level three person. You're contributive. You're going to contribute as much as you can to making a difference. And one way of really contributing is not doing terrible harms to them. So right away, you're going to be intrinsic. Value. And of course, personhood in the, um, in the fourth level is not, a, of course, every level four person believes in the intrinsic value, believes that God, the creator, has made every single human being and if they've made every single human being, then in light of the creation of God, that human being has to have intrinsic value. 
has to have a value that's worth protecting under the law. We can't usurp God's creation. We cannot usurp what God has done and declared to be good in any regard. I don't care hydrocephalic baby, right, et cetera, et cetera. We cannot usurp it. He has a soul. Uh, we believe that. The creator made him, uh, made that person with uh, the intention uh, of, of calling him good and bringing him to fruition either in this life or the next. He has an intrinsic and a transcendent, a soul like who destined for eternity good. And again, I don't have to tell you, man, if you believe in the intrinsic value of human beings, you're going to be pro life. I mean, that's all there is to it. There's no extrinsic criterion you can apply to it. I mean, the Supreme Court's decision in Roe versus Wade looks like complete silliness. First semester, first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. This is simply irrelevant and silly when you compare it uh, to the the um, to the case at hand. So here's uh, what we're faced with there. Uh, if we can help a person to get from level one and two to level three and four, then the moment we help them to get to level three and four, just call them on it and just say, hey, if you really believe this level three thing, you're going to take a chance on having an extrinsic valuation that restricts somebody and therefore you are participating in the harming of human beings when you say you have devoted yourself to the contribution to those human beings. You, you, you know, you're being utterly inconsistent. Intrinsic valuation is the only way to go. Let's go to rights uh, very, very quickly uh, here. Um, I, I wanna just draw uh, your attention to uh, the, the very principle I was making at the end. If you are a level three person, you're going to have a view of personhood, uh, which is an intrinsic valuation rather than extrinsic valuation. You're never going to take the chance of doing something that will cause irreparable harm, not just to an individual, but to whole groups and you know, thousands of individuals within those groups by advocating for, for something um, that uh, is based on an undervaluation of their true dignity, of their true worth. So um, uh, you get the point. Uh, now, the way that personhood goes, so goes rights. Isn't this the case? The whole movement on slavery was based on separating what? Human being from personhood. That's the first step that they did. And then the second step that um, in the slavery issue, right? Uh, they say, okay, well, maybe these black people are human beings, um, but they're not persons. They're not persons. And the reason that they're not persons who pick the extrinsic valuation, they came out, right? If you read the Dred Scott decision, what are the three reasons that these human beings, acknowledged human beings, are not considered to be persons? Uh, number one, uh, because they came over on slave boats and they were mastered by the people who brought them over on slave boats. In other words, they're blaming the slaves for being captured by evil people. And, and of course, that is a sign of their inferiority. And because of that inferiority, well, you know, I have to tell you, that's an extrinsic valuation. No, no, you didn't live up to expectations. You shouldn't have allowed yourself to become a slave. Second thing, of course, is uh, that uh, uh, they don't display right now a, a level of culture or a level of, of intellectual development that's worthy. There it is, the extrinsic valuation right again, worthy of personhood, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, uh, we see um, uh, not only that, but of course, that uh, these people were meant to be, quote unquote, owned uh, by the superior race. I, I, you say, no, there's no possible way that somebody could say in a supreme, unanimous Supreme Court decision that uh, the superior race, uh, a person was meant to be um, uh, oppressed by the superior race. But we did. That's right there written in Sanford versus uh, Judge Scott. But the point I'm trying to get to is you can see already these people were denied their inalienable rights because they were considered not just, they weren't considered persons. They were human beings, but not considered persons. And the way they got away with it was through these three stupid justifications uh, because they used extrinsic valuation rather than intrinsic valuation. Then you take a look even deeper uh, at the problem and you can um, see also uh, what the, uh, the net result will be um, when you bring it around to rights and where the Supreme Court in Dred Scott versus uh, Sanford versus Dred Scott just basically said, well, 
you know, they don't have any rights either. I mean, if they had any rights, remember they're chattel. You know, the chattel means right that you're uh, uh, you're not a person, so you're property. You're just property. So, in light of the fact you, you're property, the white man has a right to dominate you. And we can see the same chattel argument, the same property argument, the same denial of personhood argument in Roe versus Wade. I mean, this is just nonsense. It's got to stop. We have to stop doing these extrinsic valuations of the worth of a human being. Go back to intrinsic valuations. If you're level three and level four, go back to what you must do. You're not supposed to cause unnecessary harm to anybody, not a pre-born, not a black person, et cetera. The whole point is we owe every, to, to everybody that if you are a human being, you should be considered a person, not chattel, not property. And if you are considered a person, then a person means deserving of, of protection under the law. You have inalienable rights. You have a, a, in yourself something which evokes the duty of everyone, not just the government and the law. Every single person owes you the duty of protecting your life, protecting your liberty, and protecting your ability uh, to uh, own property and to pursue a form of happiness that does not interfere with the rights or the happiness of somebody else. So, of course, we recognize these four uh, rights, uh, by the way, which came from a Jesuit philosopher, uh, belonged to the Salamanca School um, in 1612, uh, um, uh, Francisco Suarez. And Francisco Suarez um, wrote a book called De Legibus on the Laws uh, in 1612, in which he declares these four uh, fundamental rights that belong to every human being by their very nature. Of course, Hugo Grotius uh, saw this, the father of international law, and he basically said, this is uh, absolutely the protection that we have against um, uh, what we might call a tyranny of the majority, a tyranny that can occur within a democracy where 51% of, of the population could outvote the inalienable rights of the other 49%. But if you really have an inalienable rights theory, where you really do acknowledge that every single solitary person who deserves protection under the law also has the right belonging to him or herself, that right says, uh, everybody owes me a duty to, uh, to give me to uh, give me life, to give me freedom if I haven't destroyed the freedom of somebody else, and to give me um, uh, you know allow me to own property if I've not done something to violate the property rights of somebody else. And so, okay, so um, uh, we can see now. Let's just go and make sure everybody gets the distinction between extrinsic rights and intrinsic rights. Remember. An intrinsic or inalienable right belongs to me by my very human existence. Minimum justice required, the most basic minimum justice required, that you give me the opportunity to live and not take it from me. You give me the opportunity uh, to enjoy freedom uh, over uh, the domicile of my mind, the domicile of my body, the domicile of my home, Etc. You give me the freedom, uh, not to enslave me, but enable me uh, to to live as I would have myself live. That's what it's what was needed, absolutely, to be human. Okay, so uh, that's an intrinsic right. An extrinsic right comes from the government. So with an extrinsic right, um, uh, we have our constitution, right? In our constitution, we we the people. You know, uh, and it goes on to, you know, declare, da, 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 da. and then finally, of course, there's the Bill of Rights. But the Bill of Rights is being declared into existence by us, the people. And so uh, when, when that happens, uh, we've got then um, uh, two things that we have to uh, uh, consider. Uh, the first thing is that the government gave us the right in the Constitution, then the government can take away the right in the constitution. But the government can't take away an inalienable right because a government never gave that right to anybody to begin with. Inalienable rights belong to us the very moment we are conceived as an individual human being, the very moment of fertilization, 
we become a unique, specifically human being. And when that happens, we have a right. People owe us the duty, owe us, uh, you know, the duty, the, uh, a duty to live, uh, um, uh, you know, um, to, um, to have freedom and uh, custody over our being, et cetera, et cetera. So once we see this, well, you know, why did, by the way, our founding fathers, why did the, our founding fathers not talk about inalienable rights in the Constitution? Because of that preface, we the people are declaring such and such. The very preface means avoid inalienable rights at all costs. Inalienable rights don't have to be declared into existence. We don't want even the state to have implicitly the right to take away an inalienable right. Where do we find the statement of inalienable rights in our founding fathers' documents? Where? The Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be what? self evident nobody's declaring nothing we know right on our own we know that these truths are self-evident we know that people have um, are created equal and not only that but they have the unalienable as they would put it in the declaration inalienable same thing unalienable rights of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness so that idea then it belongs to us by our very nature it belongs to us if you have transcendent identity, you believe that that belongs to us also because the creator intended it. Uh, both arguments, of course, are there in Suarez, but you don't need a religious argument. It's enough to say, as the founding fathers did, um, you know, that uh, you have, uh, you know, um, we recognize as self-evident these inalienable rights. Now, they do put that in there as reinforcement, you know, that all uh, human beings are endowed by their creator with the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But you don't have to appeal to the religious argument. Uh, it's good enough. If it, there's a human being there, that human being in minimal justice is owed, at the very least, the possibility of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, so you take these things now. No government has the right to, to take these things away. You can see what's going on. Human being leads to personhood. Personhood leads uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, human being leads to intrinsic value. Intrinsic value um, leads to personhood. Personhood means you can't be property or chattel. Personhood means you are deserving of protection under the law. So therefore, right, in, you know, personhood means inalienable rights. Uh, you know, something that belongs to me by my very nature that says I'm owed. Everybody owes me the right, uh, the capacity to, to live, uh, be free and pursue happiness. All right, let's just go quickly to abortion, euthanasia. Can't go through this too much because I've got, you know, um, I'm going to leave a little time for questions here. Uh, the first thing with abortion is you can make a really good case, a uh, biological case for abortion. I won't go into the technicalities, but at the point of fertilization, you have no question about it. DNA sequencing shows it. We've got enough evidence to kill a horse. You have a unique specifically human full genome you've got it it's right there whether it's attached or it's unattached all these things are irrelevant these are mere stages in development the point is you've got that full genome i could take that genome sequence it and tell you pretty much all the external characteristics that you're going to have and probably the development of those external characteristics if you live a normal life and you don't get put into a prisoner or a board camp or some other excruciating circumstance, pretty much what you know, you're gonna look like and so forth uh, down to uh, the way. It's uncanny uh, what can be done. In fact, give you even a, a little bit of a, a 3D um, uh, 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 image. And not only that, tell you all the genetic propensities you have and don't have, et cetera. Uh, yeah, you've got a unique uh, full human being. Okay, uh, I'll just say this, that human zygote, that cell, that is really unbelievable. When you think about that cell for just a second, it's the most unique kind of cell in the world. It's not like any other, like a skin cell, a muscle cell, a heart cell, right? It's it's the uh, a, a cell that will give rise to every other cell in a human being over the course of the of its existence. So you know, the, 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 you take a person once you have that zygote, and it is following that genomic uh, pattern. Um, uh, that's uh, set out in it, 
it's going to give rise to every cell. And not only that, it'll be the unity. The zygote will live way into your adulthood, all the way to your dying day, as the unity of all of the other cells that originated within it throughout the course of that human being's lifetime. That, what does that mean? You combine the zygote with the, the unique, uh, complete, full, uh, I mean, uh, uh, specifically human genome, you combine those two elements. The substance of a human being is there. The substance is there completely. And once you acknowledge that the substance of the human being is there, whether the substance has been achieved or not, whether the substance has been actualized or not, right? It doesn't matter whether it's first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, doesn't matter. I mean, the substance continues way after pregnancy to continue to develop. Stage of development is, is a mere accident in Aristotelian terminology, right? It's a mere accident of history as to what, you know, um, uh, you, know you have developed. What are you going to say? Because the frontal cortex is not developed in an adolescent. They're not yet a human being. Of course, they're a human being. The full substance of the adolescent is there, regardless of the fact that the frontal lobe is not yet fully developed, et cetera, et cetera. All right. I mean, the, the, the same thing, you know, if you think that a historical development argument can negate the substance of the human being as the basis for personhood, if you really think you can do that, then in fantasy, the, 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 everything's gone. In fantasy, is just fine. And not only in fantasy, but why not? You know, take, take the adolescents out too. Wow. You know, that lack of a frontal cortex that, you know, kill them too. And kill everybody, by the way, who, who doesn't have, uh, you know, full development up until whatever the, the, the current age is, you know, uh, right now. You know, of course, it's absurd. It's absurd on every level. The substance is there. Therefore, human being is there. And if human being is there, we must observe that per, that that human being has intrinsic value. If we say that it has intrinsic value, we have to say that it has uh, um, uh, personhood. If we say that it has personhood, then it is deserving of protection under the law and furthermore has the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Other uh, rights like abortion, as I said before, you know, the so-called Supreme Court declaring abortion to be a right. This is hilarious. Certainly can't be an inalienable right. Nobody needs an abortion in order to act like a human being. You know, you could say the same. Nobody needs a slave in order to act like a human being, right? So slavery can't be an inalienable right. Nobody needs a, a cell phone, although some people say some people need a smartphone. Nobody needs a smartphone in order to act like a human being. The point is pretty clear. At the end of the day, all of these things are pretty much the uh, the, uh, the result of just good legal thinking, good logical thinking. Bring a person to level three and four, away from level one and two, I'm telling you, it's going to fall like dominoes. They're going to have to be pro-life, and they're going to not only be happier for it, they're going to leave a rich life and a rich legacy of the sacredness of human life according to the creator's own intention, a creation and intention that can be known through rationality, through reasonable principles, as we have outlined uh, today. So thanks so much for your kind attention. I truly appreciate it. Uh, I think it's a good way of really convincing a lot of people. I'm going to end with one note. Um, Camille Polly, who runs a, uh, um, an organization called um, um, Healing the Culture, uh, of course, the topic of today, uh, healingtheculture.com, uh, Camille um, actually did begin to teach these principles in uh, high school classes. And even, you know, uh, when, when uh, uh, nearly 50% of the class, 49% of the class was pro-abortion uh, to begin with, uh, she trimmed that 50% down to 13% at the end of the day by the, the student's own decision. By doing what? educating them about the four levels of happiness and about the various kinds of categories of cultural discourse, which we've discussed. So thanks so much, everybody. Uh, I'll take your questions um, uh, if I might. Thank you, Father Spitzer. We give thanks Hi. to God for you. Praise to Jesus Christ for you, Father. Thank you for being with us this evening. A blessing. Thank you very much. Peter, I'll turn it over to you for the first question.
First question comes in from Ray, and he asks how all of this, like the, this this categorization of the four levels, how does it relate to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yeah, Abraham Maslow had a, a hierarchy that, uh, by the way, is very valid in, in many ways uh, relative to this model. Um, you can see uh, level one, of course, the need for food. Uh, he looks at needs, by the way. He's not looking at desires. Very different perspective. But he talks about the need for food that correlates with the desire for food uh, in the level one, two, three, four perspective. Also, he talks about the needs for self-esteem. There's level two, right? And of course, we talk about the desire for esteem, the desire for respect and honor and love from others, et cetera. Then when Maslow goes up into levels three and four, uh, he begins to uh, sort of lose touch with uh, uh, the classical philosophical tradition. And you can pretty much see that um, uh, with respect to level three, um, he does have a sense of love, uh, but in many cases, it's like being loved, which is still basically level two uh, in the uh, classical system. Uh, what we're talking about is, uh, you know, is there a need to love? And of course, that is a decision that we have to make for ourselves that this is something we want to live for, to be contributive, to want to give our, ourselves away to others. So that doesn't really come out in Maslow very much. And then, of course, um, for him, uh, to be honest with you, self-actualization is not at all um, union with God. Self-actualization is not, uh, as it were, being grounded in the transcendent, grounded in the absolute, grounded in, um, in God or perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. Um, it, it basically, in some Maslow texts, it, it uh, is talk, it's equated with peak experiences. In other Maslow uh, texts, it's, uh, it's not just having the capacity or self-determination. It's sort of like a high form of self-determination, which, again, is a little bit like level two. And the peak and daring experience is more, uh, in many ways, uh, like feelings as an end in themselves. So, alas... Um, I, I just have to say that it, it breaks down completely at level three and four, but with level one and two, there is a lot of parallelism between the need model and the desire model. Hope that helps. Thanks, Father. This next question comes in from Mike, and he asks uh, if you're cons given how you talked about personhood and rights, can one believe in the death penalty and capital punishment um, at that level four? Yes, uh, because there was always a provision that was built in originally by Francisco Suarez, later by John, uh, Hugo Grotius, John Locke, and Thomas Jefferson, all of them uh, who borrowed from Francisco Suarez's legacy, uh, all borrowed from the same um, principle, which is um, uh, the state cannot take away your right um, uh, for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, etc. But what the state can do is if you have harmed the rights of others. So in other words, if you took someone's uh, life or you took someone's uh, freedom and enslaved them unnecessarily, et cetera, et cetera, unnecessary. all slavery is unnecessary. But if you did all these things right um, uh, to a person, the state can say, hey, you know, uh, you violated that person's rights. Uh, we're now taking your right, uh, not, you can't take it away from your being. But what we're doing is we're saying we're negating that, right? We're going to incarcerate you because you are a harm to society. So there's a whole uh, legitimate defense that's of, of uh, what's called uh, uh, self-defense and the right of the law uh, to protect the common good and the individual rights of citizens uh, that Su Suarez had. And that was part of the Salamanca School as well. And of course, uh, Locke picked that up, uh, the, you know, the condition for being able to be accorded rights within society is that you have to respect the rights of others within society. If you violate inalienable rights intentionally, the, the state has a right to constrain you and even to um, put you into a, um, uh, incarceration. Now you say, well, what about capital punishment? That doesn't seem to occur with respect, um, uh, you know, the, okay, the state has a right to incarcerate you. Now, at one time, um, it was thought that the state had the right to uh, administer capital punishment for the sake of the common good, because the idea of lifetime incarceration uh, was virtually impossible. And moreover, you know, it, it was, um, uh, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, continuous torment until the inevitable death would occur by means of the, uh, the appalling conditions of the prisons. 
So for a long time, uh, it was thought that the capital punishment was needed. But, uh, you know, as Pope Francis has recently said, you know, that argument really cannot be solidly made uh, anymore um, because we do have the capacity to incarcerate on a permanent basis. So he's, uh, uh, Pope Francis has uh, revised the Catholic Catechism. He's made that uh, uh, adjustment. And honestly, there are a lot of really good natural law theorists that think he is right on the money. You know, that uh, if you can incarcerate permanently, and furthermore, if there's a chance for reform on the part of a human being, right? So that the person could come to his senses, uh, revert back to God, et cetera, or, you know, even convert to God, so long as there's a chance for repentance and salvation, and so long as, you know, the, the, you know, the, the state can afford uh, to incarcerate on a permanent basis, and, um, you know, the common good can therefore be protected by incarceration, then, yeah, there's, um, you really shouldn't uh, be killing people. Uh, capital punishment uh, uh, should be foregone just for the possibility of repentance and um, for the possibility of, uh, of uh, you know, protecting, uh, I mean, of uh, allowing this person um, uh, to live, um, even uh, though he may have committed a capital crime. So justice does not demand. It. So uh, I'd say, yeah, there's, Pope Francis did not make a bad argument. I think it's a, it's a very, very good um, uh, argument. And I think you'd have to do a whole lot of finagling to try and get an alienable rights theory to prove that justice must be done. You kill me, I can kill you. Uh, the Lex Talionis was superseded by Christ himself, right? The Lex Talionis, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, justice uh, need not be done. Uh, mercy can be extended even by the state, uh, you know, just uh, in order to rehabilitate somebody or even to allow them the possibility of conversion and salvation. Al, I see you have a, you've had your hand up here on screen. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. I'm a retired gynecologic surgeon, and I've never done an abortion. But um, over the years, frequently, in fact, uh, the commonest response in an argument with patients about abortion was, mm -hmm. I don't care. I just don't want to be pregnant. And, and so I, I wonder how you would respond to that. I mean, the only way you really have is to go up to those uh, uh, happiness levels again. In other words, the one thing you can't do, you can't convince a person, um, you know, immediately on the spot. If they just go, I, I don't care. I, I just want an abortion and just, you know, uh, you know, if you can just tell them, please just put stuff on hold for a second and consider who you are. Just it, now they may feel desperate. They may say, I don't care who I am. I don't care if I'm contributive. I don't care if I'm transcendent. I don't care whether I believe in intrinsic value or I don't believe in intrinsic value. I don't care about anything. I'm desperate. I want to, you know, end this pregnancy and, and so forth. Well, uh, as a doctor, you're stuck. You can't, of course, recommend an abortion, uh, but you can't force uh, the horse to drink. You can try and lead the horse to water, uh, but you can't force them to drink. Uh, you can say, look, just before you do this, consider, you know, these um, adoption services, consider, uh, you know, going to, I just want you to see your, your baby here for just a second. You know, just take a look at an ultrasound. But she said, I don't care. I don't want to see my baby. You know, what can you do? I, I mean, uh, at, in, in this illegal environment, you cannot force her to see her baby. You cannot force her to, to think about whether she's a level one, two, three, or four person. You cannot force, um, you know, her even uh, to consider the fact that, uh, uh, that this human being has intrinsic value by their very human existence. And um, because they have an intrinsic value, you cannot no longer um, uh, wield divine authority over that baby. Now, uh, of course, all these things, you know, are true. But if a person is in a state of desperation, I hate to say it, um, Al, but I think if they're in a state of desperation, uh, all you can do is say, I'm not going to recommend an abortion because I, I really do not believe in this. 
and I really don't believe um, that anyone has the right uh, to take the life of another human being, uh, where even if it, you know that life is residing within the womb of uh, your womb or not, uh, you have no right to, to kill that human being uh, who has an autonomous existence and of course an intrinsic value and therefore as a person and should be considered a person uh, worthy of protection under the law. That's all you can do. You, I mean, uh, unfortunately, there's no easy fix. Um, and a lot of people, uh, honestly, they, they never even have considered these four levels, which is why I think um, the education, uh, no offense, doctor, but I, you can't educate when the, the crisis pregnancy is happening. We got to get this into the high schools. We got to get it into the grade schools. Um, and I think um, uh, that's the place uh, to start. Peter, I think we'll take one last question here. Perfect. Well, there's one that came in from Teresa that would be a good one to end on. Father, she asks, she's sort of looking for a bit of a script here. Um, mm -hmm. Suppose a coworker indicates support for abortion. Where do I even begin? What is sort of the first question? You know, what I would do is um, I, I'd probably go to... Um, uh, you know, Camille Pauly has, um, uh, you know, has uh, some books. And, uh, this is an adult colleague. So I would say this. It, it, you could also just go to um, my uh, website. Uh, just go to uh, majacenter.com and just uh, click on um, free uh, articles and, and um, resources. And then um, you'll see uh, one of the pages is on faith and science, but the second page is on happiness and suffering. There's a whole set of videos there, uh, but click on the first two videos, click on the one um, on the four levels, and then click on the one on the comparison game. And if you click on those uh, videos, uh, you will see um, that, uh, you, I mean, th there's something really convincing about just watching those videos. It's not a hard watch. Um, and uh, Camille's got some uh, videos as well uh, that might be uh, also very good to, to, to watch. But I would say just start them there. Uh, don't ask them to read a text. Um, maybe just watch uh, these videos in the four levels of happiness and uh, see if it doesn't change their lives. I have found it, it works so very, very well. Um, Father Spitzer, thank you again for the blessing of your teaching, for your dedication to make all of this available. Father Spitzer, can you please give us your blessing? Absolutely. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may Almighty God bless you and send his Holy Spirit down upon you to inspire you, guide you, protect you, to give you the wisdom of the ages, the wisdom of Christ Jesus, our Lord, the wisdom that will lead people not only through reason, but through the ways of the heart into the fullness of contribution, of charity, of faith that says who we really are and help us all to defend the culture of life within this country, to defend it within the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this program from the Institute of Catholic Culture. Remember to download our app and share our online library with friends, co-workers, and family members. To learn more, get involved, and support the Institute's work, visit instituteofcatholicculture.org and visit us on social media.